and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. Frankly, I'm relieved you showed up tonight. I'll tell you what. I was just watching this video of a Chinese girl eating octopus legs. She, she just kept eating them and eating them. And I just kept watching and watching. Then I see the video has over a million views. So I tell you what, friends. If this video breaks a million views, I'll put my hair in a bun and eat Chester. All right, maybe two million. That more reasonable, pal? Real go-getter, that guy. Well, come on in, friend. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. Hmm. Oh, that's better. So, we're coming up on the year here at Casa de Blood. Yeah, I know. That went by fast. And as they say, all good things must come to an end. <sighs> Settle down, friends. You gotta say shit like that when contract negotiations are coming up. <laughs> so, smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigmarole. Told by the first voice I ever came up with. The Happy Redneck. Hey! You're listening to the standard edition of this program. To get instant access to ad-free versions of all our episodes and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu. Sign up today! It's a great way to show your support, and you'll get a whole lot for it. And authors, send your scary stories to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If you're selected, you'll get that full treatment. Shit. Tonight we're joined again by Corey Adrian. Cable guy by day, scribbler by night. Sometimes vice versa. And since you liked last week's fairy so much, we're going to go back into the wilds for a little Louisiana lore. So without further delay, I give you from author Corey Adrian, Bayou Blood. Boy, can't you just take one day and shut them damn books? Papa said sternly. I closed the small dictionary I had with me and placed it back in my bag. Papa always said, We ain't the learning kind of folk, boy. You best remember that. I hated him for that. He always said this when I wanted to try and learn something new. Reading that small dictionary was my only way to learn new words and expand my vocabulary. However, that was almost a lifetime ago. I'm 35 now with a child of my own. Papa is in a nursing home in New Orleans, living out his twilight years. And here I am on the old family homestead, leading pretty much the same life that Papa showed me. Now, growing up in the dead center of the bayou in southern Louisiana, I always had the propensity to learn new things, because let's face it, there's not much to do in the swampland other than catching crawfish and dodging gators all day long. I'd sit up in our rickety dock and toss an old small crawfish cage in the water with bits of rotten chicken in it. I usually produced about 10 to 15 big ones every time I had let the cage sit long enough on the bottom, if they were in season. As far back as I can remember, it was just me and Papa. And Papa always told me, boy, if you ain't got smarts, this swamp'll get you. But that's why you got the bayou running through them veins. Now, my papa, he was not book smart since he only finished second grade and had to drop out due to his own daddy running off and leaving his mama in a lurch. He had to do what was best for his mama and little brother, even if all he did was help clean the floors and go fishing every night. 
Papa had to keep some type of food on the table for his tiny family to survive. I was about nine years old when he told me that story, probably because he didn't want me to do the same thing to a lady that I got along with real well. You know, preparing me for the future and whatnot. But I never saw it that way at the time. Papa was a proud man, always provided for him and I, for the most part. Papa had a hard time with the devil's nectar. Alcohol, to be more specific. He had a tendency to overindulge quite often, but that's beside the point. Papa did well with keeping the household afloat. Always had a decent supper and a warm fire going on those cooler nights. That didn't last long, though. We started struggling when I was about 11. Boy, don't you dilly-dally on them cages, Papa said as I bowed my head in obedience. I pulled the first cage up on the dock and it had about seven or eight crawfish in the bottom. I showed Papa and he looked at the cage in disgust. Damn, only seven, Papa said. Sorry, Papa. Maybe not enough bait? I replied. Well, son, it don't matter. Couple more cages and we should be all right for a couple suppers. Yeah, we'll make us a stew. I sat there staring at the cage with seven measly crawfish and noticed one of them had a whole bunch of eggs underneath of it. Papa? Yes, yeah, son. Why is there a bunch of eggs on this one? Well, usually that means that the mama, Papa replied. Mama? Hey, Papa. Why don't I got a mama? I cautiously asked. Papa's face paled a bit, and I could tell that there was a semblance of hesitancy before he spoke. Well, boy, there ain't much to tell you. No need to sugarcoat it, neither. Your mama died a long time ago. She was out fooling around in the garden. Come the next morning, I found her laying in that garden. She wasn't breathing, had no heartbeat, neither. I tried and tried to get her to come back, but I just couldn't. Now, there weren't no doctors anywhere around this area. So I took your mama way out in the bayou and buried her underneath the old twisted tree, Papa explained. This news was a relative shock to me. I never even knew that I had a mama, let alone knowing that she died right here in our garden. I was staring at the garden for what must have been several seconds before I said anything. Papa continued talking. Well, you see, boy, you wasn't more than a year old when this happened. So I just start raising you on my own. Hmm. Then about three years later, you was out on the front porch and I heard you start yelling. I came a-running again from the kitchen. And you were sitting cross-legged, pointing into the swamp there. You said you was a-seeing some type of fire or something over beyond the cypress trees. So I grabbed you up and took you inside with me to finish your supper. Uh, you scared me so much that I'd never leave you out of my sight. So that's why you can't never go out there without me. I started thinking about what my papa was saying, and I realized that there wasn't so much of a single picture of my mama anywhere in the house. Papa? Yeah, boy. What did mama look like? Papa sat and thought for a moment before reaching into his pocket, retrieving a small swatch of cloth. Papa stared at it for a moment, and then he unraveled the fabric. There in the fabric was a small silver locket. He opened it and handed the locket to me. I stood there examining the small picture. Mama was a very pretty lady. Long black hair and what looked like a rather expensive hair clip in. Slender with a pale complexion. Mama had deep piercing brown eyes that seemed like they were looking at you any which way you moved the picture. Your mama was the prettiest girl in town. We had met a long time ago when I was working on a daddy's farm. We used to just sit and talk during my short breaks, and she'd bring me ice-cold sweet tea. Yeah. Eventually, she ended up telling me that she had had enough of her daddy's rich living and wanted to live among us common folk. <laughs> I never knowed exactly what she would want to do there, but we made some arrangements and she come down here and stayed a while. 
We got along real well, and then we ended up getting married. Your mama and daddy didn't like me too much on account for stealing his daughter away from him, so he decided that he wasn't going to talk to her no more. Papa took the locket back from me and placed it back in the swash of cloth. I noticed before he wrapped it up, there was a strange symbol on the front of the locket. Looked like a star with a circle around it. Papa, what does that star mean? Uh, well, son, uh, your mama had a few different views on things. She believed in a god and a goddess. She would always put this star on everything. Some about the elements or whatever. She would go outside in the nighttime, light some candles, and then sit there for a while. Hell, I even seen her sometimes drinking the swamp water. I had asked her about drinking that nasty water once, and she told me this. The swamp water is for protection. It'll carry me through anything. Makes me feel stronger. Now, since I don't really believe in those sort of things, I kind of let her do her own thing. It was a bit above my learning, Papa said. Papa started to stand up on the dock. Uh, well, I reckon this I have to do for today. Best be heading inside before it gets too dark, Papa said as he took a drink from his hip flask. Okay, Papa. I replied, following him inside for the night. The evening went on as usual. We steamed up some crawfish and rice, and then Papa made a nice gravy. He called it the poor man's crawfish etouffee. Wasn't much, but it's what we had. Later on in the night, Papa switched on the radio and listened to his favorite station while sipping on his glass pint of whiskey. He would drink on that whiskey until it was gone, smoking at least ten or so cigarettes before he finished his bottle. Sometimes he would just sleep in his chair until the next morning. It wasn't long after 11 o'clock that Papa had been passed out in his chair. His snoring sounded like a jackhammer. I slowly stood up from the old couch we had and decided to step out on the porch. Opening the screen door slowly, that way the creaking of the door wouldn't wake Papa. It was hot even in the nighttime. Muggy as all get out but nonetheless felt good to get some fresh air away from that musty old house full of cigarette smoke. Walking now to the edge of the porch, I could look down and see the small frogs and tadpoles swimming around the swamp. If it weren't for all the mosquitoes in the area, then this would be a mighty fine place to relax at night. I took a seat cross leg on the porch, staring down at the swamp and getting lost in thought. I thought about my mother and how Papa had told me he had found her in the garden up beside the house. I looked at the garden and then back at the murky water. I couldn't see much further into the swamp because we only had the one porch light and it didn't reach far into the darkness of night. I leaned up against one of the posts on the porch and looked straight out into the abyss of the swamps. Just then... I saw a small reddish-yellow light far off into the distance. It had looked to me like it was a small ball of fire just dancing around in the woods. Perplexed, I stood back up and tried to squint my eyes to see better. Not one, not two, but now three balls of light started circling around one another. I was amazed at what I was seeing. I began to move down to the edge of the porch closest to the phenomena I was witnessing. The sudden noise startled me as I realized that I had accidentally knocked one of our old crawfish cages into the swamp, and it wasn't tied off. I had a sinking feeling in my guts because I knew Papa was going to be mad. Boy, what you doing? Get your ass in here now! Papa yelled as he was opening the screen door. Sorry, Papa. I just wanted a little fresh air, and I, I accidentally knocked one of the cages into the water. I said timidly. What the hell I tell you about being out here by yourself? I done told you that you ain't supposed to be out here by yourself. Now you done lost one of the cages, and you ain't a care in the world. What you doing out here anyways? 
Like I said, Papa, I just wanted a little fresh air and come out here to breathe a little, but then... I trailed off, looking in the direction of the now undetectable fiery balls. What, boy? Papa said, with a hefty edge of aggravation in his voice. I thought I saw some lights down in the far end of the swamp there, just lighting up and bouncing around, I replied. Papa looked at me with angry eyes and said with a low and slow tone, Get in the house, now. I walked in the house as Papa held the door and let it slam behind me, startling me slightly as I turned and sat on the old musty couch. Papa, I'm so- Shut up, boy. I done told you not to be wandering around out of my sight. Papa interrupted with a snarl. I know, Papa. I won't do it again, I promise. I was just getting some air and then I saw those light things and I just wanted to see what they were. Papa sat back down in his armchair and sighed. <sighs> Boy, you ever heard of the Le Foufoule? No, sir, I haven't. Hmm, well, let me tell you something. Le Foufoule is something your mama talk about all the time. Some about fairies. Some say that it's your loved ones coming back and checking on you after they long dead. Yeah, boy. But most folks around here say it's the evil spirits trying to lure you into a trap and kill you. Your mama was obsessed with them and left little things outside in the garden. Gifts, she called them. Now I wasn't so sure that your mama hadn't gone off her rocker. But I loved her just the same. So I let her do the things she wanted, and I kept to myself. Hmm. But she was always writing funny symbols all over stuff, like squiggly lines and small pictures. Mm hmm Always telling me the fairies be good to her if she leaves them things, like feathers or some type of shiny stuff. She would leave them gifts in the garden, and the next day, they'd be gone. The fairies, Papa? I asked. Yeah, I know how it sounds. She believed in them things. Your mama started doing this stuff every day. And she got quieter and quieter as time went on. Till she had you. She kept giving thanks to them fairies, hoping it would bring you safety. She kept fussing with you and them fairies so much that I didn't get to spend time with your mama. Huh. And that kept on for about a year or so. Papa's eyes started to well up, and this thousand-yard stare got even deeper. Yeah, your mama depended so much on them fairies. And I remember one night, you were fussing so much that she forgot to lay out a gift for the fairies. We all went to bed after she laid you down and fell asleep. She shot straight up in the middle of the night and jumped out of bed and started rustling around. Are you gonna wake the baby? I told her. I forgot the gift. Oh my God, I forgot the gift. Your mama said. Well, don't be silly, Abby. They ain't gonna be mad about it. Just come back to bed. Your mama kept messing around in the house. And then she turned to me and said, Don't worry. I'll fix it real quick. And then I'll be back to bed. Okay, Abby, you do what you gotta do, I told her. Well, I soon fell back asleep waiting on it to come back to bed, and I slept like a log. Next thing I knew, I was waking up on account of your cry. I look over, and your mama wasn't in bed. So I just figured she was already up and on her way to get you out your crib. Well, I stood up and got my clothes on and walked out into the kitchen. You were still crying, so I went into your room, and there you were, just laying there squirming around. I picked you up and started hollering for your mama. Abby! Abigail! Where you gone to? I didn't hear nothing, so I started walking around the house looking for her. I looked everywhere. I finally figured that maybe she went off to the market to get a few things. So I got you all cleaned up and fed you your oats. Once I had you nestled back in for your nap, I started prepping the crawfish cages for the day. 
I walk around to the side of the house to grab them cages. That's when I saw your mama, laying there in the garden face down. Looked like she had tiny scratch marks all over her. I ran over to her and started shaking her a bit to see if she just fell asleep in that garden. She wasn't moving. I leaned over and felt her face and it was ice cold. Her eyes was open and kind of grayed over. That's when I noticed she wasn't breathing. I tried and tried to bring her back, but it'd been too long. Since there wasn't no doctor folk around, I done buried her under the oldest cypress tree in the swampland. That's why there's a wooden cross in front of that tree. Papa sniffled, and then all of a sudden his eyes shifted towards the window. Slowly he stood up and walked toward the full running panes of glass. What in God's name, Papa said in a puzzled tone. I stood up and crept closer to the window to get a look at what Papa was staring at. There in the distance, a ball of light a bit bigger than the ones I had seen before. Papa, it's the light. I told you I wasn't fooling you, I said. Go to your room now, Papa yelled. I didn't wait around for Papa to tell me twice. I ran to my room and shut the door. I could hear Papa shuffling things around in the living room. Then heard some loud banging noises. I slowly inched my door open just a sliver so I could see what he was doing. Papa was taking old boards and nailing up the windows. I could hear him muttering something under his breath. Damn this swamp. Damn it straight to hell. I didn't want to get caught watching, so I shut my door and just listened to Papa nail them boards to the windows. He didn't stop until all the windows that he could see were covered. However, in his haste of hanging all those boards, he quickly winded himself, and I heard him plop back down into his chair and heard the pop of the cork from his whiskey bottle, followed by the lighting of a cigarette. He drained whatever was left in his bottle, and then there was just the sound of the crickets in his radio. Soon after Papa settled back down, I noticed a slight glimmer of light emanating from my window on the opposite side of the room. He forgot my window, I whispered. I stood up and walked to my window, where a small ball of light was hovering about twenty or so feet away and about three or four feet off the ground. The very instant that I laid eyes on the mysterious ball of fire, it started moving towards my window ever so slowly. Once the ball had arrived about five feet from my window, I felt like I heard some faint noise like an ethereal voice talking softly. I closed my eyes as the words became more and more discernible. Those were the words that were spoken. Now, I don't know what it meant at the time, but as soon as those words became clear, the ball slowly faded back out of view and into the darkness of the swamp. I stepped away from the window and sat on my bed. I rifled around in my small desk drawer and retrieved the pencil and a piece of scrap paper and wrote down the words that I had heard. I folded the piece of paper and stuck it inside an old dictionary I had tucked into my desk. I walked back over to the door and opened it slightly. All the windows in the living area and kitchen were poorly boarded up, and Papa was once again snoring in drunken bliss in his chair. I closed the door and laid myself down on my bed, thinking about that ball of fire. Before I knew it, I had drifted off to sleep. Boy! Better get up. Ain't no sense of sleeping the day away, Papa roared. Slowly, I wiped the sleep from my eyes and Papa came into focus in the middle of the room. It took me a few seconds to register that he was holding something. Looked like a small box. What you got there, Papa? I asked drowsily. Well, this is really all I got left of your mama. I figured that you'd like to see the rest. Climbing out of bed, I took a few short steps towards the small box Papa had in his hands. 
It was a dark wooden box, but it had sayings and that star again all over it. Papa handed me the box and I lifted the lid open. Inside there was a small black and worn leather bound journal, three small corked glass vials, two with some type of liquid in it and the third looked like wings from a big bug. There was a lock of black hair tied with a ribbon and what appeared to be alligator teeth and old metal beer tabs strewn about the bottom. On the inside of the lid was an older black and white picture of Mama and Papa together, younger though, and seemed quite happy. What is all this? I asked. This was the last of your Mama's things. She carried this everywhere. When she went into town, this was with her. When she went out to the garden, so did the box, so on and so forth. It was my figuring that you maybe wanted these things here so you could be a little closer to your mama. Thanks, Papa. Papa turned around and walked out of my room, and there I stood with all that remained of my mama. Several minutes passed as I just stood there in the center of my room staring at the contents of the box. I removed the small journal and set the box down on my desk. Opening the journal, I saw my mama's writing for the first time. The first entry written was dated Friday, June 18, 1954. Here's what it said. It's humid out this morning. The paper said it's going to reach up to 98 degrees. I'm six months pregnant today, and I'm really starting to feel like I can't do much for Sam. I feel like I'm getting weaker and weaker by the day but I can't let it slow me down. I walked out further into the swamp today, trying to explore a little further out. I saw this old cypress tree with real long gnarly limbs. It almost felt like the tree and I had a sort of connection. When I touched the tree, it almost seemed to breathe. Now, I know that's nonsense. Trees don't have lungs and they certainly can't breathe, but I felt it. Well, that's enough for today, I suppose. I gotta get going before Sam gets home with his haul today. If it's a good haul, then we'll have our work cut out for us. Until next time, Abby. I stopped reading and looked away from the journal and up at my bedroom door. Papa was standing in the door frame and staring at me with his arms crossed. You about ready to hit the water? Yes, Papa. Placing the journal back into the box and closing the lid, I proceeded to pull on my boots and grab my hat. Walking out of the house, it was awfully hot and humid and reminded me of the journal entry that Mama had written. Papa started rigging the aluminum boat and loading it up with the trap hooks and ice boxes for the crawfish. Best be getting on, boy. If the market ain't got no crawfish by opening time, then we gonna be out of a job, Papa urged. Yes, sir. Papa climbed into the boat first and held it steady against the dock, allowing me to get a good footing while boarding the boat. I sat at the bow of the boat and Papa was at the stern in control of the small outboard Johnson motor. The cages we had deployed were about a mile or so down the river, so there was a fair amount of time just sitting and talking. Papa, have you read Mama's journal? Papa just kept staring ahead, directing the boat, and his face dropped a little. Almost like he was disappointed. I done told you, boy. I really ain't the learning type. Never did get a good hold on that reading stuff. Your mama was a rightly smart lady. She knew how to read and write. Yeah. But my mama and pa never did learn how to do either. So I never did get much learning, Papa explained. Oh, so Papa, can't you read? I've seen you sign your name on the papers at the market. So you know how to write? Yeah, <laughs> boy, that's only because your mama taught me how to write my name. But that's all I know. Your mama made sure you had all them books in there. That way you could learn how. Your mama always told me that she wanted you to have a good education. You know, book smarts. That's why your mama's friend at the schoolhouse will come out on the days of the week to help you learn. Papa further explained. Well, do you want to know what's in the journal? Boy, it's been about ten years since that book been in that box. I ever known this whole time, and I ain't itching now. 
Enough about all this stuff. We got work to do. Before I knew it, we were approaching the first cage buoy. Get that hook, boy. Pull up that cage, Papa demanded. Yes, Papa. I said as I reached for the hook. I leaned over the side of the small aluminum boat and hooked onto the metal ring attached to the top of the buoy, hoisting it into the boat. I then pulled on the rope until I felt the weight of the cage itself lift off the bottom of the swamp. Slowly it came to the surface. I reached out to grab the top of the cage when I noticed something in the water. Right there in front of my face was a reflection that did not belong to my own face. No, this was something that I couldn't quite make out at the first glance. The water became steady as I stopped moving the cage around and the reflection became clearer. This was the face of a woman. Long black hair, pale face, and eyes that were darker than the bottom of the swamp at midnight. Boy, what you doing? Papa yelled, breaking me out of my trance. Sorry, Papa. I, I thought I saw a gator and needed to make sure. I responded, trying to make something up quickly so I didn't have to tell Papa the truth. If you done saw a gator, get the gun, Papa replied. Well, I thought it was a gator at first, Papa, but I think it was just a big fish. Sorry, Papa, I said, hoping he would believe me. Well, okay, but them crawfish ain't gonna haul themselves up out of there. Get back to it, boy. The very instance that Papa had startled me out of my trance, I realized that I had dropped the cage back down into the swamp. So quickly, I pulled the cage back up carefully, trying to avoid staring into the water for too long. This cage was almost full. There had to be at least 100 to 125 decently sized crawfish in there. Yeah! Boy, now that's a crawfish haul. Gonna be doing good today, boy. Ha <laughs> ha! I feel like it's gonna be a real good day! Yeah! Papa was right. That was just the first cage. We ended up having the same luck at our last seven cages, all of them plumb full of crawfish. We headed off a little further down river towards the market. When we arrived, Papa walked into the market up on the bank and asked if he could get some help unloading today's haul. Papa came back to the boat with another man about 20 years younger than him. The other man, Papa and I, carried our fair share of the load up into the market. I watched as Papa and the market owner dumped all the crawfish onto a giant table filled with ice. After that was completed, the market owner handed Papa a piece of paper and Papa signed his name. The deal was that for every pound of crawfish Papa brought in, he would get a dollar. That day, we made $135. Papa was as happy as a pig in mud. The other part of the bargain was that Papa could take home four pounds of crawfish. So we took our four pounds and shopped around the market for potatoes, onion, corn, carrots, celery, and various seasonings. Papa even bought some shrimp. We were going to have ourselves a crawfish boil tonight. After purchasing the items previously mentioned, Papa also bought himself his usual pint of whiskey. We loaded up our boat and headed back for home. The trip back home was a good one for Papa. He was happy about how the day had turned out, and honestly so was I. However, I was pretty silent most of the time because I couldn't get that reflection I saw out of my mind. You all right, boy? Papa asked as we were pulling up to our rickety old dock. Yeah, Papa. Just a little tired. It's awful hot today. I replied, not revealing the whole truth. Well, I got you something when you wasn't looking, Papa said as he produced a bottle of ice-cold Coca-Cola out from underneath the ice where the crawfish and shrimp sat. I was elated. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Papa. I exclaimed while quickly standing up and giving him a hug. I almost tipped the boat over in my excitement. Ha <laughs> ha, you're welcome, boy. You enjoyed that. Not every day you get one of them, Papa replied. Papa was right. I maybe received one of these once every six months, so this was truly a treat. I decided to put the Coke in the icebox until Papa had made our supper. Boy, it was a feast. The aroma of the boil was welcomed, filling the house with hints of pepper and seafood, as opposed to the smell of musty air and stale cigarette smoke. Papa emptied out the boiling pot into a strainer 
and dumped the contents over a newspaper-covered table. I retrieved my Coke out the icebox, and we both dug into that glorious meal. Mmm. Well, boy, hmm, that was one of the best suppers we've had in a while. <laughs> Why don't you go and get them cages out the boat and put them up for the night? Yes, Papa. I replied, savoring the last sips of the sugary soft drink, knowing that it was going to be quite a while before I'd have another one. I stood up, excusing myself from the table, and headed outside to the dock to gather the cages. Stepping outside, I noticed that it felt considerably cooler due to the fact that the sun had finally set and its rays were no longer a burden on my skin. Walking over to the boat and retrieving the cages, I set them up on the side of the dock so as they were ready for tomorrow's deployment. I turned around and looked over at the doorway, and there stood Papa, watching as he always was. I turned back towards the swamp and glanced at the large cypress tree looming over most of the trees in the surrounding area. I felt a small tinge of remorse as I stared at the tree for a moment. So I turned back towards the house and walked back inside. Papa closed and latched the screen door behind me, turned on the radio and proceeded to settle into his armchair with his new pint of whiskey. The song Louisiana Mama sang by Gene Pitney emanated from the speakers of Papa's old cathedral-style radio. He sat there tapping his fingers to the rhythm of the song, taking a fresh swig from his bottle. I walked into my room and turned the lamp on. Closing my door behind me, I walked over to the box on my desk, retrieving the journal and opening it to the second entry. Monday, June 21st, 1954. This last weekend was quite eventful. I didn't get a chance to ride in here because we had so much going on. Sam was busy building a cradle for the baby, and I spent my time out in the garden preparing the various vegetables for an early harvest. I was also thinking about performing a ritual that could potentially reveal whether the baby was going to be a boy or a girl. I'm not too sure about how Sam would feel about that, given the fact that he doesn't believe in the craft. I'll see how receptive he is when I ask. I know here in a few months we are going to be harvesting in September for our winter storage. A lot of canning to be done. Sam is going to try to get some wild game so we can cook it up and can it, or freeze. The baby is starting to kick real hard. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm hoping Sam and I can settle on a baby name soon. I was thinking Virginia if it's a girl and Calvin if it's a boy. I hope Sam is open to those names. Until next time, Abby. I closed the journal and laid down in my bed just thinking about what Mama had written. Papa had always stocked up our freezer and pantries with food enough to last us the winter. Plenty of fish and gator. Sometimes Papa would get him a whole deer and that would be enough for the two of us. I laid there thinking about Mama's words. And then came the visage of that reflection I saw in the water. I realized fairly quickly that the reflection had a striking resemblance to the picture of Mama in Papa's locket. I stood up and walked over to my desk and opened the drawer that held several books. I selected the modern dictionary and a Creole translation book. I opened the dictionary to the piece of paper upon which I had written the saying, Fait confiant non marécage la. I started looking in the Creole translation book and slowly started to piece the saying together in modern English. Trust in the swamp. That is what the words translated to. I quickly grabbed the journal and flipped to the third entry. Friday, June 25th, 1954. It's been about a week since I've been able to write. Sam has finished the cradle and I myself have done some collecting. I've collected some swamp water and two small vials, fairy wings, alligator teeth, and placed a lock of my own hair tied with the ribbon with these other items. This is meant to be a safety talisman. All of these things together provide protection. I will carry these wherever I may go to keep Sam, the baby, and myself safe from the darkness of the swamp. Darkness of the swamp? I asked myself. I continued reading the entry. The swamp has recently been very unforgiven. Sam hasn't had much of a haul this week, 
and at night I swear I keep seeing things deeper in the swampland. Small flickers of light. I'm not too sure what they may mean, but it reminds me of a story that my grandfather used to tell me about Les Le Follet, swamp fairies. The story goes that they are the loved ones once passed on, checking on other living family members. However, there's another story that says they're evil entities trying to lure you into a trap. Once you are caught, they take you. Maybe I'm going crazy, but I know what I saw. I think maybe just to be safe, I'll start leaving small tokens of appreciation to these possible beings. Maybe it could help. Until next time, Abby. I closed the journal. Fairies? Seriously? I asked myself. I placed the journal back into the box and closed the lid. Turning around, I started walking towards my window, looking out into the ever-darkening swampland. It only took a few moments and then I saw them. Several burning dots of light appeared near the big twisty cypress tree. I finally decided that enough was enough. I was going to find out what those lights were once and for all. I slowly opened my door and found Papa snoring loudly in his armchair. Grabbing Mama's box, I started my way through the house. I'm going to have to be extra careful if I'm going to get by Papa, I thought. I opened my door and started carefully making my way past Papa and through the front screen door. The door shut behind me, barely making a noise. I looked back through the door, making sure that Papa was still asleep. He was, holding his mostly empty pint of whiskey in his hand. I moved further down the porch and onto the dock. I stepped into the small aluminum boat very carefully as not to rustle the water any more than needed. Untying the mooring ropes, I grabbed the old wooden oar tucked underneath the seats. I used the oar to softly push the boat away from the dock. Making my way around the house quietly, I managed to maneuver the craft through the narrow passages that directed me towards the inner swampland. I remember it being very quiet out, no crickets chirping, just the sound of the water cascading over the oar as it ebbed through the water. Still able to make out the small balls of light, I directed the boat towards them. Closer and closer I approached. The lights never moved, hovering exactly where they had been. Soon, the crude cross that Papa had placed under that cypress tree came into view. The balls of light were getting bigger as I approached. I could make out some more details on these illuminated balls and noticed they were almost alternating. As I drew in close, I could make out small creatures in the center of these balls. Fluttering wings seemed to cause the light to generate. They looked like oversized dragonflies. I got about 10 feet away and the three balls of light stayed perfectly still, hovering in place. Les Foufoulets, the fairies, I exclaimed. Then suddenly the fairy shot straight in my direction. They stopped inches from my face. I could see now they were ugly brownish creatures with dragonfly wings. Their eyes were beady and completely black. My attention, however, was focused on what looked like razor-sharp talons on their hands and feet. One of the fairies buzzed a little closer to my face, as if it were studying me. The creature then made a horrendous squalling sound. Sounded kind of like a pig squealing after it had gotten injured. The swampland's darkness then illuminated in a great yellow-red light as hundreds of other fairies lit up surrounding me. The fairies' buzzing noises reached an incredible volume as they encroached on my location. The box, I whispered. I turned and quickly removed the box from under the seat. As soon as the fairies saw my movement, they moved in quickly as if they were about to attack. Quickly, I positioned the box in front of me and immediately the fairies froze in place. Several of the creatures were inches from me, enveloping me in a whirlwind of light so bright that I'm sure you could see it from a mile away. I heard a loud noise off in the distance. Boy! Boy! Calvin! Where you done gone to? I heard Papa yell from the house. I looked back and saw Papa standing on the back porch waving a lantern around yelling for me. 
I could tell he was worried because he never used my real name, always calling me boy. Papa seemed to immediately draw in on my location due to the light given off by the fairies. Don't worry, boy, I'm coming! Papa yelled frantically. He started tromping through the swamp without a care in the world, heading in my direction. All of the commotion had effectively gotten the fairies' attention, and just as if they were one whole being, all of the fairies rose up into the air about five feet or so. Then all of them darted for Papa. No, wait! I yelled at the creatures. I saw them quickly advancing on Papa. I realized that the old Johnson outboard motor was still on the boat, so I quickly pulled the start string and the engine whirred to life. Setting the throttle to full, I quickly turned the boat around and headed towards Papa. By the time I had gotten about halfway to him, the creatures had engulfed him. I heard terrifying screams of pain coming from Papa as I made my way closer. I opened the box and threw several metal beer tabs at the fairies, causing them to stop their ferocious attack. The creatures collected the beer tabs and had left my papa alone. I quickly grabbed papa's arm and we both struggled to get him inside the boat. Papa looked real bad. Both of his eyes were bleeding and there were gashes and cuts all over him, more than I cared to count. Papa was breathing pretty heavy and he appeared to be extremely weak. I had decided that instead of taking Papa into the house, I would take us to the small town and see if there was a doctor anywhere nearby. It took us about 25 minutes to get to the small town, and as luck would have it, the market owner was still there at the store. Help! Somebody please help! I yelled, trying to get the small boat to the dock on the shore. The market owner heard me and ran out to see what was happening. My lord! What you got going on here, son? The market owner exclaimed. My papa, please help. He got hurt real bad. Please help me, sir. I replied. Come on, son. Let me help you get this boat tied off and get him up off the water. Yeah, ain't no need to call me sir now, either. The name's Ulysses. Yeah, we're gonna get him up on the shore here, and I'll run to the doctor's house to see if he's home. We pulled papa out of the boat and laid him on the dock. Now, you wait here with your pa, and I'll be back as quick as I can, Ulysses said. Ulysses ran off into the darkness and I was left on that dock with Papa. Sitting there silently and noticing that Papa was now unconscious, most likely due to blood loss and pain, I started looking out into the swamp and I noticed three fairy lights hovering on the other side of the river. I focused my attention on them and then the light became significantly brighter on the immediate surroundings in their vicinity. I saw a figure slowly rise from the swamp. The figure was slender and about five feet tall, it seemed. Then my blood froze. The figure started walking on top of the water towards me. I was able to overcome the frozen fear by slowly backing away. Creeping backwards, the figure grew closer and closer. I was so overcome by fear that I tripped over my papa, falling onto him and quickly picking myself up. The time that it took to fall and pick myself up, the figure was now at the end of the dock. It seemed to stop as if some invisible force field was prohibiting it from moving any closer. Calvin. I heard in an ethereal voice. In fact, the same voice that I had heard in my bedroom when I saw the lights. Frightened, I started to speak. What? What is it? What do you want from me? Calvin, say confiona marekela. The figure said. Trust in the swamp, I whispered. Yes, Calvin, yes, that is correct. My, oh my, how you've grown. I am so proud of you. The figure that claimed to be Mama said. I broke my trance and took one step forward. I could see the details start to form in her face. She looked exactly like the picture in the locket that my papa had showed me. I took two more steps towards her. Calvin, I miss you so much. I'm sure that by now you've found that the fairies like gifts. Your papa never really understood this much. I gave them gifts to keep us all safe from evil spirits. That's why the fairies attacked him. He had never given a gift. 
Your papa had built that house upon some of those creatures' most sacred land. Up until I came along, he didn't have much luck in his ventures. When I started paying homage to the creatures, then fortune was in our favor. You, though, you were smart enough to throw those tabs for the fairies. They accepted them as several gifts. Please, Calvin, whatever you may do in life, trust in the swamp. Mama said. Mama seemed to slowly recede into the darkness as the light from the fairies dwindled down so completely that they were gone. Mama, wait, Mama, please. What all this hollering? <laughs> Papa! I yelled, running back to him. Papa was barely conscious, and his breathing was ragged. Papa, I saw Mama. She came to me and explained all about the fairies. I exclaimed. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where are they? I can't see nothing. <laughs> no, Papa, they aren't here anymore. They left. I said, while getting a better look at Papa's eyes. They were so severely cut that it looked just like dark red circles where his eyes should have been. I had never seen anything so gruesome in my life. About ten minutes later, Ulysses came running back up the dock with another man. Son, this is the doctor. He gonna see if he can help your pal, Ulysses said. My name is Dr. Hammond. What in the name of God has happened here, son? The doctor asked. Well, my papa and I were out in the swamp and he fell out of the boat. He started screaming a whole bunch, and I could barely help him get into the boat. Maybe a couple of gators? I said. I had to make something up, because if I had told them the truth, they may have put me in the crazy house. Well, I ain't never seen a gator attack like this. We better make arrangements to get him to the clinic, said the doctor. Ulysses left to round up a few other men around town and brought a stretcher with them. They loaded Papa onto the stretcher and carried him to the small clinic in the middle of town. I followed them and waited patiently in the waiting room for any news. A few hours later, the doctor approached me. Son, your Papa is in a very bad way right now. He will recover, but it will be quite some time. See, your Papa was rendered blind by this attack, and we need to monitor him for a couple of weeks to make sure there ain't no bad infections getting away. What am I going to do? I asked. Your mama ain't at home? No, sir. I ain't got a mama. Well, then, I'll call over to the children's home and see if they have any room for you there for the next couple of weeks. Yes, sir. The doctor walked away and left me once again in the waiting room. I sat there and recounted the events that had just taken place just hours ago and wished that I could go back in time and stop it before it began. That was not the reality of this situation, though. What happened has happened, and there's nothing that can be done to undo the horrible event. The doctor came back a few minutes later and explained to me that I was going to be staying at the local children's home until my papa was fit to leave the hospital. He told me that some lady named Melinda was going to swing by shortly to pick me up and escort me to my home to gather some clothes and personal effects. Just as the doctor said, an hour later, Melinda arrived to escort me to my home and gather my things. I walked her back down to the dock, noticing that my papa's blood was still splotched over the grayed planks of wood. We climbed into the boat and set off. The dawn was approaching, filling the sky with beautiful shades of pinks, purples, yellows, and orange. It reminded me of the fairy's glow. We arrived shortly at our small home, and I noticed a slight expression of distaste on Melinda's face. You live here? Yes, ma'am. We approached a small rickety dock and climbed out of the boat. I walked inside, and Melinda followed me. I gathered my clothes and placed them in an old burlap sack that held the potatoes Papa had purchased from the market. I grabbed my dictionary and some paper and a pencil. Okay, ma'am. I've got everything I need. Are you sure? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then I guess we're off. We walked back outside and climbed back into the boat and headed off into the sunrise back toward town. The journey took about 25 minutes and we were back at the dock behind the market. Melinda climbed out of the boat first. As I stood to exit the boat, I stopped. 
I reached under the boat's seat and retrieved my mama's box and slipped it into my burlap sack. I stayed in that children's home for about a month when I had received word that my papa had definitely been rendered blind and crippled due to his injuries and could not be a proper caretaker for me. The state would continue care for my papa since he had become disabled. At least I knew he was in a good place to where I didn't have to worry about him. So at the children's home I stayed until I was 18 years old. At 18, I found myself a job at the very same market that Ulysses owned. I worked hard for several years and saved a few bucks. I was able to return to my old house out there on the bayou, and it really hadn't changed much except for a few more rotten planks on the dock and some leaks that had developed in the roof. It only took me a couple of months to whip the house back into shape and become livable again. It wasn't too long after that, one day while loading turnips into a market display, I laid my eyes on the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Her name was Lila. I somehow conjured the courage to speak to her, and from that point on, we were two peas in a pod. A few years later, we had a beautiful baby girl, and we named her Abigail in honor of my mother. We had the best life I could ever ask for. I had a good job. Finally moving on from the market, I had enrolled in a trade school and became an electrician. About ten years went by, slowly fixing up this old house. It finally became our dream home. One night, though, when I was arriving home after a late night at work, I saw something that sent jolts of fear into my body. There by the old giant cypress tree. A solo fiery ball of light hovered just feet off the swamp's surface. I stood there in shock, and no sooner than it had appeared, it was gone. Once I had my breathing and nerves under control, I grabbed my tool pouch and walked into my home. My wife was reading a book on the couch. She looked up and smiled at me. Hey there, honey. How was work? Her voice was like some of the sweetest honey that was ever created. Oh, you know, just another day, darling, I replied as I leaned over and gave her a kiss. Is Abby asleep? I asked. She went back to her room a little while ago. She may still be awake, but she's had a long day, Lila said. Okay, darling, I said. I walked over to my daughter's bedroom door, which used to be my old childhood bedroom. I noticed a faint flickering light emanating from the crack under her door. Honey, I asked my wife. Yeah? She asked in return. Does Abby have any candles in her room? Not that I know of. Why? Lila retorted. Right then and there, my blood ran cold. Because from beyond the door, I heard these words uttered by my daughter. What do you mean, gifts? Shiny things? Okay, I promise. You've been listening to Buy You Blood by Corey Adrian. A good reminder to heed the wisdom of those who went before you. Or better yet, just move already. Yeah, I'm one to talk, I know. A little about the author. Corey Adrian works by day as a cable technician. When he's not putting creative ideas to paper, he enjoys restoring antique radios, woodworking, and all things creepypasta. He has a beautiful wife, a daughter, and a stepson. <laughs> Sorry. You can find him on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Corey.Adrian.3, the number three. Stop by and say hi. I hear he's got those black boxes with free HBO on them. Also, back up ten episodes and you can hear his story static on this very podcast. Season 2, Episode 10. Thanks, Corey. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens, by the way. 
So feel free to accidentally subscribe as many times as you want. I won't tell anyone, I promise. And if you feel like spreading the word and helping old Drew Blood out and convincing a friend or two to subscribe to my podcast, that would help me out greatly, and I'd really appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, but keep your wits about you. Feel for lay or the least of your worries out here. And so, friends, may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Trust in the swamp, and go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.